Sydney talks, but maybe you'll remember that this was the last talk you heard <laughs> in 2018. Right. It's not a talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's been a bit of a turbulent year, I must say, but uh, I wish everyone a, a good, better 2019. Uh, so, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, okay, so uh, last time I spent uh, unexpectedly long talking about old stuff, namely vector models, but they have the advantage that they actually have physics definite physics applications. Now I will move on to, to that Hoft, uh, uh, Hoft large n limit. Uh, large n limit. And basically, it was invented shortly uh, after invention of, of QCD. So let me write down this golden formula, the pure glue, pure glue SUN gauge theory has the action, which is S is minus 1 over 2 G young mills squared uh, integral D d d x times trace f mu nu f mu nu right uh, and this is in the conventions where one over g young mill squared n is out front and then f mu nu is just uh, d mu a nu minus d nu a mu plus i commutator a mu a nu so this <coughs> So this is uh, one convention where it's actually will be easy to do uh, to do large n counting, uh, but basically we all know that the, these gluon fields are in the adjoint representation, so we can think of them in the double line notation, namely we can think of them as uh, as the propagation of an index and uh, and an anti-index. Right. Uh, so then, uh, basically, what we want to show is that if you take large n limit where g n mil squared n, uh, the interaction strength is scaled to zero appropriately, then you achieve a smooth limit. Right. So this is in the language of uh, uh, that I used yesterday. This is the case where the number of degrees of freedom is expected to scale as n squared because uh, more precisely, it's n squared minus 1, but this is not very important in the large n limit. So we can do some rescaling, right? Uh, there is another choice where you rescale uh, uh, A by a factor of g n mills, and then the vertex, the triple vertex of the gluons will carry the factor of g n mills, and uh, there will also be this kind of vertex, and this carries a factor of g n mil squared. So let's do some very basic counting. So let's look at the, pro uh, the leading propagator correction. Right? The leading propagator just looks like this. And then there is a correction of, of this sort, right? where there is a gluon loop. Right? And this has a factor of g n mils twice. Uh, but what factor of n does it carry? For that, we go to the double line notation. So if this is normalized to be of order 1, so this looks like this. And now we can draw this. Uh, with, and then you see that there is an additional index loop, right? So if you draw these flow lines with arrows, right, so... This looks like this. So every time you get an index loop, you get a factor of n because it's it's summed over. So this uh, the net factor is g n mil squared n. g n mil squared n, and uh, and then you immediately realize that if you want to have a smooth uh, smooth large n limit, this has to be held fixed uh, held fixed as as n goes to Infinity. Uh, okay. So one loop diagram uh, with a quartic interaction vertex that's subdominant uh, with regard to this, right? Well, uh, 
which one? The <coughs> this, like this, uh, like this one. Or well, you mean like this? Yeah, they're all of the same order. Like the the seag uh, the seagull, right, or snail? Yeah. Why why is it suppressed? Well, it's zero because. Uh, but physically, you know, if you impose a sharp, I, I'm not talking about details of regulators or quantum field theory. I, I might as well be working in <laughs> zero dimensions. Then let's draw this diagram, right? This diagram, uh, if you draw it in double line notation, right? Uh, yeah, so there will be, uh, oops. Uh, Yeah, I guess this one is suppressed, right? No. Did, did I draw it right? One, two, three. Yeah, so this is G Yang mil squared uh, N, right? So it's not suppressed. It's not suppressed. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, one of the main messages that, that basically while uh, in the vector models uh, some stuff was suppressed, but Th this is actually a diagram that I want to call the snail. And, and this one will not be suppressed either. We, we can, we'll draw it in a second. That's so. also planar diagram, the sunset diagram. Yeah, yeah, this, uh, they're all planar, right? So, so the message will be that actually, so let's do some, some counting of powers, right? For that, it's convenient to Maybe as a warm-up, let's just do also some vacuum diagrams because that will be useful for... So if you, for example, just look at just the free gluon loop, right, uh, that's just double line, right? So this gives a factor of n squared. But then if you, if you draw, for example, this kind of diagram, right, that's of order g n mil squared, uh, and this uh, we can count the factors of, of n that will appear here. So if you draw it in double line notation, it basically looks like this. Okay, so, uh, so there are different ways of doing this counting, but one convenient way is where you keep this actually out, uh, out front, right? So, so since one over g n mil squared is of order n, you basically see that a vertex will carry, any vertex will carry a factor of n, any propagator will carry a factor of 1 over n, and any index loop uh, will carry a factor of n, right? So, so basically, in this convention, you see that a graph, a graph carries, uh, carries the factor of n, to the power uh, vertex plus face minus edge, right? Because an index loop corresponds to a face. For, and, and when you count vacuum diagrams, you also count the outer loop because it's kind of, you think of it as a sphere and the back, the back of this diagram is also a face. So here there are, for example, three index loops. So, so if you do this counting, right? So how many index loops are, so here f is equal to three, the number of vertices is two, and the number of edges is, is three, right? The edges are just propagators, like one, two, three. So here you get a factor of n to the power of squared again, right? Everyone knows, most people here know this. But don't worry, something interesting will come. <laughs> Okay, uh, so you basically get this top famous topological expansion, right? Namely, that uh, the crucial formula here is that this is equal to n to the chi. And chi is the Euler characteristic. Characteristic. Euler established for all convex polyhedra, this is 2, right? Whenever you count a convex polyhedron, and, 
add uh, vertices plus faces minus edges, you get exactly two. But more generally, you have uh, this magic formula that chi is equal to 2 minus 2g, two where g is the genus of the surface. Right? For closed surfaces, like sphere has genus 0, just count the number of handles. Uh, torus has genus 1, and so on. So, so far, I've drawn all, all the graphs I, I've drawn are planar graphs, or the ones that are drawn on spherical topology. But you can come up with also graphs which are uh, uh, not spherical. For example, you can add a non-planar line, the one that goes under, under here. And you can check that if you add this non-planar line, you can draw the figure like this. Right? You can draw this figure in this fashion. Uh, and then if you count the number of index loops, you find that so now there will be six edges. So for this for this graph, you uh, so for this graph you get six edges. Uh, two. No, four. Four. Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, no, no but it goes oh. under. It goes under. Oh. That line goes under. So. No, six. 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 <laughs> yeah, the number of propagators, right? Whether how I draw it doesn't matter, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? Yeah, so I don't know. I'm pretty jet lagged. So <laughs> 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 uh, okay, so uh, but the crucial thing is that there are only two index loops. If you actually follow this thing, if you take your finger and follow this around, this whole contraption here just gives you one index loop. Right. Unlike, for example, if you drew it like this, then you would have more index loops. So there are only two faces, and the number of vertices is four. Right. So here you get n to the power uh, four plus two, uh, two minus six, which is zero. So this is already non-planar. I mean, it's obviously non-planar, but this contributes. This has topology of the torus. No, 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 it's, uh, it's really different topology. Okay, so, uh, so this, is, this is the picture, of course. Uh, so you get, uh, you get a whole class, and, and this actually, so originally this was invented as a way to do large N expansion in QCD, right? In particular, uh, because, for example, let's focus on a relatively simple case, which is D equals three. Right, so three-dimensional pure glue theory. There is now extensive numerical data on that, thanks to work of Tepper and, and collaborators. And you, you can, for example, so what does this uh, large end, Hoft large end limit predict for us? It tells us that, uh, that, for example, if you look at some dimensionless quantity in, in QCD, like ratio of, say, global masses to square root of string tension, they will have a nice expansion in powers of 1 over n squared. Like the correction really first appears at order 1 over n squared. So for example, in uh, d equals 3, you know that g n mil squared has, uh, has dimensions of, of mass, right? So, so you know that square root of of the string tension in the fundamental representation has to go like g young mills squared n, right, times uh, perhaps some corrections like uh, times 1 plus b over n squared plus dot dot dot, right? Uh, and also you know that, that, for example, if you look at any mass, uh, mass of a given state divided by square root of of this string tension. That's a dimensionless quantity, so it will have some expansion like m0 plus 1 over n squared m1 plus 1 over n to the 4 m2 and so on. And uh, I actually have this, uh, I'll submit uh, 
some file with various plots, but uh, there are various nice reviews by Tepper and collaborators uh, uh, who they basically pl uh, they did calculations explicitly for n equal to two, three, four, up to a pretty high number, and then looked at this quantity and plotted it as a function of one over n squared. And you see that in many cases it's only, for example, these and these terms are visible. Or sometimes the plot versus n squared, one over n squared looks really linear. So you can, from these plots, deduce what the large n value of masses is, uh, which is one of the things of interest. What is it in, in planar, uh, planar QCD? So this is one reason to... Uh, so there is an uh, overwhelming belief that if QCD is going to be Solve, uh, somehow solvable or semi-analytically tractable, it, it's bound to be so first in the planar or large n limit. It's certainly, so the, the main issue is that the number of these planar graphs is still huge and is not summable. So these theories are only solvable in only some special uh, circumstances. So this is one of the advantages of the large n limit. And another advantage so, uh, is, for example, so if you think about uh, a totally different Young-Mills theory, which is n equal 4 super Young-Mills, that's another theory where all fields are, let's call it maximally supersymmetric. Supersymmetric SUN. Then, uh, then you can write the action. So, in addition to a mu, there are also six adjoint scalar fields phi i, and then there are some uh, uh, wild fermions psi a. But each one is in in the adjoint representation. And uh, so, all the n counting will be exactly the same. And then there is this dramatic simplification in the uh, Toft large n limit. Uh, namely, uh, that there is a dual description in terms of ADS5 crosses 5. And I have a little bit in my lecture notes about this. There are, of course, various sources to learn about this. But uh, I just want to stress that uh, the reason this theory is somehow tractable is something additional that happens beyond that Hoft limit, right? So one early sign why why this was uh, uh, so I would say ADS-CFT certainly would not have been discovered if there wasn't such a thing as large n limit because at finite n things are a lot less obvious. But uh, if you, for example, look at the radius. Uh, so they each have radius L, right? And you have this famous relation that can be derived in various ways that L to the 4 is equal to G young mills squared N times alpha prime squared, right? So you see that if you keep G young mills squared N fixed, then your space sta uh, stays of fixed size, right? So, so it's certainly this relation uh, is commensurate with the large end limit. You're just working on a fixed string background. But then there is an additional uh, kind of serendipitous simplification. Additional, uh, uh, and this is truly amazing unexpected part, uh, is uh, simplification where G young mills squared N uh, becomes much, much bigger than one. And then you can approximate the full string theory on ADS5 cross of S5 in terms of supergravity. So there is a supergravity approximation. And uh, so, so supergravity becomes valid. And this makes this rather dramatic prediction that all the unprotected operators have scaling dimensions that... Uh, uh, that go as uh, that grow. Okay, so if you take uh, uh, and this has been by now also checked. So, 
So one thing that uh, people have made a lot of progress in, so another amazing feature of this large end limit in, uh, in uh, maximally supersymmetric theory is the exact integrability. Integrability allows to find uh, to find non uh, to very high loop order uh, expansion of various quantities, uh, planar scaling dimensions. And in my notes, I I gave sort of one example. It's certainly not not my work, but I think there are some very impressive results. Like for example, if you, so one generic operator is this Kanishi operator. Kanishi operator, uh, which is um, just trace, just basically the first thing that comes to mind, right? Something that's uh, singlet under the SO6 symmetry so it's sum from over all six squared uh, trace phi i phi i. Uh, and uh, so its uh, dimension in the free theory is going to be two. And you find that this delta of this Kanishi is two plus, uh, so if you denote lambda is g n mil squared n, you have uh, two plus 12 over four pi squared lambda uh, and now it's known to many many loops I, I already lost track uh, maybe 12 <laughs> loops <laughs> something like that uh, some amazing precision but then <laughs> this picture also tells us what to expect at lambda so this is the expansion for lambda much much smaller than one and then there is a different formula uh, which is de uh, delta is equal to 2 lambda to the 1 quarter minus 2 plus 2 lambda to the minus 1 quarter plus various corrections. And this is true for lambda much bigger than 1. And this is really a striking result, which I think was first highlighted in the paper by Gobsor, Polyakov, and me. This is basically a sign of the fact that this operator corresponds to a massive string, to the leading massive string state, because there is this formula that delta is equal to 2 plus square root of 4 plus m squared l squared. And if you just plug in m squared is equal to 4 over alpha prime, which is the first massive level, turns out to correspond to Kanishi, you get exactly this asymptotic behavior. And then through many years of painstaking work, people actually obtained some subleading corrections. And then there is a numerical solution that very nicely interpolates between, between these two formulas. So, so this large n, since part of my message is in praise of large n limit, I would say if we didn't have this large n limit, we wouldn't have known about ADS CFT and we wouldn't have known about integrability of the planar and equal four super angles theory and a lot of these wonderful mathematical results would not be known to us. Uh, okay, so, so I think, but, uh, uh, so I'm skipping of course over precisely how this was motivated, but you can see very briefly in these lecture notes that I, I submitted. Okay, but now let me move on to uh, to the main story of my talk, which is the tensor large end limit. So, uh, are there any questions uh, at this point? Yes. About the previous diagram, why does it correspond to the torque? Oh. I think you can. S yeah, there is a kind of handle that that you can see. Yeah. Oops, that's not mine. <laughs> oh. Where did it go? Oh. Yeah, it basically for the, uh, when you think about what it would take for the two lines to cross under each other, there has to be like an overpass, right? So this line that goes above, it really goes through the handle. 
Because if it was a sphere, it wouldn't be able to to pass over the other line, right? Okay, so so now uh, so let me so you see that uh, one thing that uh, we we notice is that there is a dramatic jump in complexity uh, as you go from vectors to matrices, right? The number of diagrams that are planar is still huge. Well, the number of diagrams contributing in the vector case was relatively small. It was only bubble diagrams. So what many people thought, I in particular thought, that if you go to tensors, it will become some totally intractable mess. And people started playing with tensors already in the early 90s, and no one knew what to do with them exactly. But uh, I want to show you that there is actually a dramatic simplification for, t for tensors of rank 3 and higher, which sometimes makes them actually much simpler than, than the matrices, and almost as simple as, uh, as vectors for in terms of solving, solving the theory. Okay, so, so to see what goes on, uh, so the next topic of my lectures is is uh, snails versus melons. And you can see some of it on the back of my t-shirt. It actually, uh, I came up with this uh, message when I was lecturing at the Tessie School a year and a half ago. And then the students, uh, students always make a t-shirt during the last week of the school where they combine different topics. And someone very creative put this pink snail on a watermelon because <laughs> it's really more like watermelon diagrams. So, so, the, uh, so the snail is, is basically this. And the melon, so, so the snail you can sort of see. And you can see the real snail in my lecture notes. <laughs> and this takes more imagination to identify the melon. Here, it becomes a melon when there are many stripes, right? Like if you, uh, so this is a, a rather feeble melon with only three stripes. But if you do something like this, uh, and then have lots of. Then, then it becomes more watermelon-like. Uh, okay, so so let's just go over different types of. So I highlighted these different types of large n limits and the behavior of uh, of the comparison between these these diagrams. So let's first take the vector case. The vector case is where the interaction, I, you can just do the, the simplest thing, d equals 0, which is convenient for doing combinatorics, right? You strip away all, all the spatial dimensions. And someone remarked that, that this, this type of diagram, which also goes by the name seagull or tadpole or, you know, uh, tadpole is usually the one with in phi cube theory, but... Uh, that this diagram usually vanishes by analytic continuation, right? Like if you do dimensional regularization, this this is a pure parallel divergence which vanishes. But uh, but if you are stuck in d equals zero, namely you're just doing the integral, like for example here you could just literally do the integral d phi i uh, product from one to n d phi i over square root of two pi. Right, and here you just have e to the minus v, just a plain integral where v is, say, g over 24, uh, phi i, phi i, phi j, phi j. Right. Uh, and the question is, uh, how do the leading... So if you draw the index structure of this vertex, it looks basically like this. Right, so this is the i index and this is the j index. So let's look at the snail uh, diagram in this case. Then it will look basically like this. 
this is a snail diagram, so it has a factor of g, right? Uh, so this is proportional to gn. So you immediately see that to have smooth large n limit, this has to be held fixed. And in this case, let's call this lambda. So this, this is held fixed. Did you find colored chalks? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. I'm about, I already <laughs> I laid them out. And Okay, so this, this is held fixed. And then if you look at the uh, melon, right, the best you can do is the following. Uh, so this is the snail. And then the melon looks like this. Right. Uh, so now you see that this goes like only g squared times, but there is still only one index loop. You can't have more index loops than one. So this, uh, this is basically a water lambda squared over n, so therefore it's suppressed. And that's the reason why everything is dominated by these bubbles. You just start building more bubbles upon bubbles, and, and that's what this Hu hubbard stratonovich transformation does for us. Okay, so now let's look at the matrix case. Um, so this, this was the case for matrices. Yeah, there is no, no. I think another one, you could draw it also like this, sort of in a non-planar way, like where these, these lines like pass under each other, but that's still the same, it's really the same graph topologically. There's only one snail. <laughs> you mean how? how okay. Yeah, the, the quartic vertex. Uh, yeah, I don't see any other way. Because this index has to be the same as this index. So you can only, like, connect this part. And yeah, I mean, if or you, you want to draw it like this. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's suppressed. Yeah, that's much smaller than this leading one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're completely right. I, yeah, here I, I should also add like some uh, plus phi, phi i, phi i over two, like just yeah, so that there yeah there is a propagator, which is just one in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, m I meant to write. This, this is just the interacting part. The, yeah, the free part is, uh, is, is this. Yeah, you start with a Gaussian integral, and then you make it non-Gaussian by, uh, by doing this. Okay, so now let's, let me discuss the matrix case. And the case probably where many of you have seen it is the Hermitian matrix. But just for fun, I want to discuss, uh, so first of all, this model clearly has O-N symmetry, right? This is a D equals zero O-N model. D equals zero O-N model. So just for fun, I'll discuss a somewhat non-standard non matrix model, which is a uh, uh, general real matrix, just real, real matrix, namely not symmetric with distinguishable indices let me call it phi, phi AC. Okay, and, uh, and each index runs from 1 to n. Runs, and uh, C also runs from 1 to n. Okay, so, so then uh, let me write the following interaction. So again, we uh, then the model, you want to enforce O n cross O n symmetry for this model, which is possible because indices are really distinguishable, right? So it's in the fundamental of O n cross O n, and the first O n acts on the first index, so, so basically, uh, so phi A C is equal to some M1 A A prime, M2 C C prime times phi a prime C prime. This is the O n cross O n transformation. And let's write 
uh, the potential, which is uh, on cross on invariant. So, so here we will write like one half phi AC phi AC, and we have to invent some nice potential. Uh, so let me write down which respects the symmetry. So we have one over twenty four phi A one C one phi A one C two. Uh, then phi phi a two c one phi a two c two right and this in terms of matrix multiplication this can be written as just g over twenty four times trace five phi trace five phi transpose five phi transpose. So it's a particular choice of interaction. And now, how do we draw this? So here is where the color chalk comes in. Uh, handy. So you can draw the, for example, A index with the red line and uh, C index with the green line. So let me try to do this. So this vertex, so first of all, the propagator can be uh, then in the double line color notation can be written like this. And the vertex, so this is the propagator, and the vertex looks like this. and carries some factor G up to some unity or something. Yeah, so that, that was, uh, right, this is the, so the people call this a stranded notation often, like in terms of just the, so you just think of it as a multi-component 5-4 theory with a particular symmetry uh, imposed on it, and this is the stranded. And then we can experiment with what snails and melons give us, right? So, for example, if you look at the leading uh, correction, which which looks like uh, four colors to there are four external yeah, but two are, uh, they're pairwise <laughs> connected, right? They're That's like. Right, but this right no, 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 the index flow lines are, like this is A1, right? right. Yeah, this is A1 tied to A1 here. Right. Right. Yeah, you think of these as like, the, the mnemonic is that this is like phi A1 C1, right? Yeah, so this, th then this, this is the C1 index and this is, yeah, but they're, they're indices of the same type, I mean. Right. Yeah, so in principle, anything green can eventually be connected to anything green. Then. So let's try to draw the snail propagator correction. So what does snail look like in, in this language? Uh, you, you basically can, can do this. So, so you have... Uh, And and then this will be right. So you see that this is a quartic vertex here. One, two, three, four lines, and two are connected like this, right? So so here you get a factor of uh, g. Uh, so because there is one index loop, you get g times n. So this tells us that. <coughs> The G, GN, which is lambda, is held fixed again. Just to appeal to the what I did with Young Mills theory before, it's completely consistent, right? Because in the Young Mills case, uh, this G was really G Young Mills squared, right? Because it's a quartic vertex. So here, this indeed has to be multiplied by n to 
to get the fixed scaling. Okay, now let's look at, this is already a diagram someone asked me about, this melon diagram. So let me try to, to draw it. Like this. So, so here I have And then, uh, then there will be a green loop like this, and the red loop like this. Right? So, so then let's check that this scales again in the leading way, right? Because here there are two factors of G. And then there are now two index loops, one green and one red. So this is like g squared times n squared, lambda squared, and this is fixed. Uh, so, I mean, this still contributes at leading order, which is not surprising because you could have said this before. It's just two different planar diagrams. So, so both planar and uh, no surprise that they both contribute. Okay. Uh, so now let me move on. So here is the crucial leap, which probably many of you have not seen it, or at least some of you have not seen it, which is what, uh, let's move from, from this matrix case to add one more index. Okay, so let's look at, uh, Okay, so now we want to have an O n cube model, and we take a tensor phi a b c, right? And this tensor, uh, you can think of a kind of like a matrix with an added middle index, right? So now the stranded, uh, and then each each index is distinguishable, so you basically replace this uh, unstranded line by a triple line. Right, so this triple line will look like, yeah, there will be green, then blue, then red, then red. Okay, and then, so obviously there will again be some uh, phi ABC squared term in this D equals zero model. And then what about uh, the, inter the choice of interaction? And here there is actually some choice. And what I haven't told you is that even here there is some choice. Can you see what, cho what other terms you can write? Yeah, double trace, right? I, I think I already mentioned this, but so even here there is a bit of a choice, but it's uh, somewhat familiar that can also add like V double trace. Uh, which will, uh, which looks just like, say, G, let's call it G prime times phi A1 C1 phi A1 C1 times phi A2 C2 phi A2 C2. Right, and in terms of matrices, this can be written as G prime times trace phi phi transpose all squared. So the question is, what do you do with this term? If you add it, you actually can add it, and sometimes it's very useful to add it, but you have to scale this g prime to zero faster than g. When you, and, and somehow these, uh, including g prime, corresponds to kind of gluing different spheres together. Like you can disentangle this term, this term you can disentangle using this hubbard stratonovich transformation, unlike this term. And, uh, and this, uh, I actually worked on it a lot in the early 90s already and, and then later. And the upshot is that to, not to destroy the large end limit, you want to keep g prime n squared fixed. 
And for example, if you are doing this as a field theory in 4 minus epsilon dimensions to keep it renormalizable, you really have to add both terms. You cannot get away with just adding one of them because you have to add all terms allowed by symmetry. And we'll see a more complicated version of this for tensors. Okay, but now what about, so let's try to think up a basic interaction that, uh, that we want to have. And the basic interaction turns out to be like this. Uh, it's called the, the so-called tetrahedron interaction or tetrahedral. Direction. And we can write it as g over 24, phi a1, b1, c1, uh, phi a1, b2, c2, phi a2, b1, c2, phi a2, b2, c1. Now, this interaction was chosen in such a way that every two fields have only one index contraction. For example, these two have only A1 in common, these two have only B1 in common, and so on. So how do you draw it in this stranded notation? Uh, it turns out you cannot draw this in a planar way. So, so if you go to the stranded notation here and add the, the line here, you have to do the following with the middle line. You can you, you have to basically draw one line like this, but the other line must pass underneath it. Okay, in other words, uh, so this would be like phi A1, B1, C1. Okay. And this you can basically recognize as a tetrahedron, like if you deform these lines. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, there is some similarity. Like when we studied this theory in four, mi four dimensions, four minus epsilon, it has some similarities with fishnet theory. Like even some of the formula we got for scaling dimension were a bit similar, right? I, it's simpler than fishnet, though. It actually, yeah, I'll, it's a very, in the, in the end, it turns out to be a very simple model. Okay, so how do we see the tetrahedron? We can basically draw it like this. Uh, we can draw this, uh, let's just deform this. Oops. Yeah, we can deform these red lines like this. Then green, right? then green here, then red here, and then the blue lines pass like this, right? right. And this is clearly a tetrahedron, right? Like you can think of, uh, maybe you want to think of this as the back edge, but, right. And then, so let's look at the uh, combinatorial factors for these uh, uh, snail and melon. And it was convenient not to erase this because you basically see that to add, so to add this blue middle line, you have to do it in such a way that it, it passes underneath, uh, underneath itself, right? So for example, here it goes through like this. goes through like this and then like this okay so amazingly enough this does not add any index loop this tetrahedral restriction does not add any index loop and you still get gn here but when you look at uh, when you look at the other one right then you have to you put for example this line here and this one has to go underneath in both places. But that allows you to add an index loop. Right, so that's, that's the proper melon drawn in the stranded notation. And here you see that there is one green loop, one red loop, and one blue loop. 
very symmetric. So this actually has g squared n cube. Right. g squared n cube, and we gotta call this lambda squared. So therefore, if we say that g goes like lambda over n to the three halves, right, then you see that this becomes negligible because this is lambda over root n. And all these uh, snails now get overwhelmed by melons. So, so that's, that's the crucial thing. So you see that only this melon propagator correction survives, even in d equals 0, where, uh, where <coughs> there is no a priori reason to ignore this story. And then, so he, here comes, so then you want to see what additional and this should remind you of Subir's talk, right? Uh, Subir showed some, some melons coming from, uh, from SYK model, but here we're getting melon just by arranging in this season in a peculiar way. Uh, now you can ask me uh, what happens if you, if you include additional vertices, like it's sort of our choice, but again, if you, this is not an exhaustive list of, of invariants, right? So in addition to this tetrahedral interaction, you can also add additional things. And now, so you could sort of be dismissive of the double trace because it's a really disconnected diagram, right? It's just a product of two disconnected pieces. But here you can draw another contraction that's still fully connected but is not tetrahedral. And this is called the pillow. For example, there are additional three so-called pillow interactions. Uh, interactions. And, and those uh, which are neither double, tra not double sum nor like this. So they look uh, like things like, for example, G, G pillow, like phi A1, B1, C1, phi A1, B1, C2, I, A2, B2, C1, I, A2, B2, C2. Right, so you see that now these two fields have two indices in common and these two fields have two indices in common. This one actually can be drawn in a planar way. All you would do is perhaps something that you could find more natural, which is connect this line like this and this line like this. You can do this, right? But then what happens is that with this contraction, the snail is no longer, it again dominates. So you can still add it to the theory, but it sort of has to be subleading to the tetrahedron. If you add it as the only leading interaction, it will, be overwhelm, uh, it will overwhelm the, the tetrahedron. So admissible theories of melonic type Basically, it turns out that you have to scale this GP uh, as 1 over n squared. You have to fa scale it faster. And then finally, there is a true double trace term, which is just phi ABC squared, all squared. And this, yeah, just one second. So you can also add this double, double sum term, and that has to be scaled like 1 over n cubed. And then things are OK. But but this is somehow the, the important thing is to keep it leading. Keep it leading. That's the, that's the secret for making a melonic theory out of a regular tensor. Yeah, you had a question. Can you similarly also consider theories with the <coughs> cubic interaction rather than the Yeah, cubic, no. Yeah, that's sort of one of the puzzles about uh, Cubic you can, of course, do with matrices rather easily. But see, uh, if you impose like O n cross O n already, you cannot do it with cubic, right? Like here, you can do it with a single gauge group, but uh, with a single symmetry group. But O n cross O n already restricts you to quartic, right? That's so already here you can ask this question, right? So this restricts to quartic. 
some people find it convenient to think of this as just a set of n matrices labeled by B, for example. But then you have to take the simultaneous large n limit. You can say it's kind of a multi-flavor uh, matrix model. I it's perfectly possible to generalize this to, there is another way to generalize it to ON1 cross ON2 cross ON3. But then the only interesting limit, melonic limit, corresponds to sending them to infinity simultaneously. Maybe not exactly the same, but you want to send NI all to infinity. And then actually, if you look carefully, what you need to do then is to send, uh, keep G squared and one and two and three fixed. And this is not, uh, yeah, yeah, so it's some uh, really new limit. So what is, what is new about this limit when you go to higher order diagrams? Like you can, for example, start looking at higher order things. And, uh, and you get this amazingly simple picture that uh, all surviving diagrams. Uh, so first of all, uh, the whole free energy will scale like n cubed. Right, because there are n cubed degrees of freedom, right, and uh, and all surviving diagrams, these so-called melonic diagrams, uh, it's a somewhat confusing title. Many people find it confusing. It was coined in a paper by Banzom, Gorau, Riella, and Rivasso, uh, and. Uh, People, not everyone sees melons right away, but, but essentially uh, you, you get, uh, are obtained by iteration, obtained by iterating, iterating just, you replace, you insert a melon inside the propagator. You just insert this, okay? So then at the next step you can, for example, obtain melon inside melon, right? And then you can obtain melon inside melon inside melon, like you can basically do this. So there, are, and it's a very simple algorithmic procedure. And it's actually exactly the same as what you get in the SYK model. You can also insert them here and things like that. So in the SYK model, as to be explained, this had to do with averaging over this disorder. Like the melon, uh, so, so the SYK picture, like if you forget about details, you can just write the following model where you have this J, I, J, K, L, for example, times, uh, say, Psi, I, Psi, J, Psi K Psi L. This would be an example of a Majorana SYK model, which is a bit simpler than the one Subir was discussing. So then the picture was that when you make a propagator correction, right, you, you have this graph, but there is also this uh, disorder averaging, which is usually denoted by, by a dashed line, right, because you you have this average, uh, you insert, uh, yeah, you have to, you have J, I, J, K, I, J, K, L, J, I prime, J prime, K prime, L prime. And this will be just a product of delta functions times some scaling, uh, uh, I, I should say one thing, that in what I'll be doing, uh, I, it's important to distinguish the number of indices uh, that this index takes an SYK model from what I called N. Because, because here, uh, let's just call this, I tend to call this, it runs from 1 to N SYK. And for models that I'll be discussing, this NSYK is actually what I call N cubed. 
so it's a very different sort of uh, <laughs> picture. So, so I will identify as NSYK as N cube because I'll have fermions labeled by triple indices, right? So each I uh, gets replaced by a triple index A, B, C, and this triple index takes N cube value. So, yes. Okay. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to make this uh, sort of this quantum field theory, or you will always generate eventually the vertices that will lead to very strong scale contributions? No, no. There is the large end limit is consistent with field theory. Uh, we in fact applied exactly this construction to five four field theory, and uh, and we obtained the. Uh, uh, Schwinger Dyson equation solution of the theory. The only issue with this field theory is that it has, you could call it a complex CFT. It has some complex scaling dimension, but if you like complex CFTs as much as Slava Rychkov does. Well, you just said the relevant operator to a normal free field theory, so. Well, it, it just in four, mi we did like four minus epsilon. Oh, oh in three. Well, we, we don't know. Yeah, in 3D, it still has a complex dimension. Well, can it be? It's a unitary model. Let it just flow. Well, well, this potential is not uh, bounded from below. Yeah, that's, that's sort of... But uh, as a somewhat redeeming feature, we, we looked at a model with sextic interaction, and then in 3 minus epsilon, it's actually a stable potential then. And then for some range of dimensions, it's per perfectly unitary, but... Yeah, so so it's 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 a general large end limit, but uh, there are definitely and the interesting thing is that if you look at solution of beta function equations, these scalings are automatically consistent with beta functions. So so you're not doing anything that's illegal. You're just taking these subleading scalings for the additional terms. So and matrix model, this makes sense. Yeah, yeah. As a, as a Oh, is it d equals zero? Yeah, yeah and it certainly makes sense. Even though it's not stable, there is a range of g where it's okay. What, like the integral exists? Well, it, you know, like in matrix model, of course, we always continue it on can continue it on stable range of g, right? Like that's one thing that uh, I probably won't have time to do it in detail, but it's it's in my notes. Like, for example, if you Suppose you look at uh, suppose you look even at the matrix model, right? Uh, so in the matrix model case, you write this integral product d phi a b, right, over square root of two pi, and then you take this e to the minus uh, phi phi a b phi a b over two. Uh, and let's add this uh, minus g over 24 uh, trace phi phi transpose squared. So this is a problem that I, is isomorphic to what was solved in this uh, historic paper by Brezen, it's Exxon, Parisi, and Zuber. Uh, and they essentially found that if you, so if you look at this as z, right, so you look at f uh, f is equal to log z, right? And this gives us just sum over connected diagrams. Then we know that f over n squared has the following expansion, that this is f0 of lambda, right, plus 1 over n squared f1 of lambda plus and what they managed to do is they basically managed to solve for this function exactly, right? And if you want to look it up, it's... Uh, so this lambda is, uh, yeah. is g, uh, g times n, right? So we know exactly what this function is. And this function is uh, analytic down to negative values, right? There, there is some... Uh, no, 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 but that's the whole point, that you can send it to negative lambda. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, the lambda, yeah, you can continue. And that's exactly where this made, uh, the connection with 2D gravity is, yeah. right? 
yeah, you want you the connection to to the gravity is for lambda less than zero. So so you basically find uh, let me just look up my notes. So th also in my notes I solved this uh, vector model and the large end limit, but but you you find the following the following answer, which is uh, th there is some master quantity that comes in, which is this some auxiliary quantity a squared of lambda, which is square root of one plus two lambda minus one, okay, divided by lambda. And then you see that this this has a branch cut starting at minus <laughs> one half, right? So there is some critical value, lambda critical, which is equal to minus one half. Okay? And then then what what we do then is we find that that the leading non-analytic piece in lambda, so this leading leading non-analytic piece uh, is F0 goes like lambda minus lambda critical to the 5 halves power. Okay, th there is just, so the exact f formula for F0, let me just write it down. So you define this A squared and F0 is equal to 124 a squared minus 1, 9 minus a squared, minus 1 half log a squared. This is the exact analytic answer. And you see that it only acquires some kind of square root branch cut at negative, exactly in the region where it's unstable. And then the idea is that you think about the reason you need the plus sign here is so that you're expanding in positive weights, right? So that you're really thinking of the dual lattice as a random quad quadrangulation of the theory. So the negative lambda is somehow compensated for the measure? Or mm. How do you view... Well, I, the negative lambda is because uh, you're looking... A large end limit is semi-classical, right? And uh, so if you look at the eigenvalue, this, uh, so what are you doing, right? You are... But why does uh, it converge? So the only thing it could converge if something it, for the measure... Yeah, the sum over planar graphs converges, right? Not the sum over all graphs, of course. So the, what they discovered is how to s separate graphs into planar, genus 1, genus 2, and each sum separately converges. That's how we define... Uh, that was all the craze in the late 80s, early 90s. Is in fact, uh, knizhnik palakov zamolochik of scaling predicted this exponent 5 halves. This is related to Liouville theory. No, this. But this, uh, the whole connection with Liouville theory only is possible in the unstable range. Now, you can ask, why, why is the unstable range OK? Well, that's because you, know, you, you can convert. Let me just go back to a slightly simpler matrix model, which is just, say, the cubic, like, uh, you know, cubic Hermitian matrix model, which is also discussed which also gives the same answer, then, so for Hermitian matrix model, you can always go diagonalize it, right? You have U lambda, U dagger, and then there is a measure which, which is uh, uh, van der Mond squared. So, you, so you'll get like product D lambda I, van der Mond squared of lambda. So this actually gives you some repulsion, right? So the eigenvalues tend to and then they sit in this kind of funny potential, right? Uh, uh, so when, when you take, for example, the potential, which is like trace phi squared plus G3 phi cubed, or minus G3 phi cubed. Uh, right, it looks like this. So you say, why is this stable? Well, because you're doing semi you're just looking at positions of eigenvalues and they form this kind of they sit here. They're still on the down slope here. So the it's enough that the last eigenvalue is being pushed down by the potential. 
and then you're what happens at this lambda critical is that this final eigenvalue is right on the brink of stability. And then they start like, because they feel it feels the repulsion of all these ones, and it just starts pushing it over the hill from all this repulsion. But that, that's the magic of a large N, that it stabilizes the unstable things, <laughs> right? Well, often, like, yeah, and this is exactly, so this is this magic application to 2D quantum gravity, right? Because when you, when you draw the, the, this tri triangular, triangulated random surfaces, right? Then you introduce the dual lattice. And here the dual lattice consists of triangles. Let lattice is made out of triangles. Maybe <coughs> next time I'll, on my laptop I also showed the dual lattice for this colored surface, then it's made out of squares, but it's a similar idea. So you basically take these triangles and you start like connecting them in all possible ways, and this matrix model somehow magically solves this problem analytically, right? Uh, so, so essentially the way this, and then people realized even more, so, so from this, uh, this is just the partition sum, but then one can introduce operators and compare it to quantum Liouville theory. And this agrees with this uh, PZ scaling. Uh, so the leading, basically, uh, the leading, the universal behavior of the partition function will be like n squared lambda minus lambda c to the 5 halves plus n to the 0 some number here, n to the zero log lambda minus lambda c plus some, another number, one over n squared lambda minus lambda c to the five halves. And remember these magic words, double scaling limit, right? Basically, people said, let's just scale n to infinity and lambda to lambda c simultaneously so that this just gives you a, a a finite parameter that you keep fixed. So you, you keep, uh, keep this n times lambda, n squared lambda minus lambda c to the 5 halves fixed. And that's called the double scaling. Scaling limit. Where, because if you just do a single scaling limit n to infinity, then only planar graphs survive. But you can kind of enhance the non-planar graphs by sending this additional lambda minus lambda c to zero. Okay, so, so then the point is that uh, for d equals zero tensor model, it's not that different. And you actually get, uh, get a solution. Uh, by summing up, uh, and this was done actually long ago already. So you solve the Schwinger-Dyson equation. The Schwinger-Dyson equation summing the terms for the propagator essentially looks as follows. Well, the lambda critical itself, its value is not universal. But what does have interpretation is the distance of lambda to lambda critical. Yeah, and that, that actually, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so why are you sending this lambda to lambda critical? Okay, the, yeah, the, the interpretation is that this parameter, people often called it delta, not the scaling dimension of an operator, but lambda minus lambda critical. That has an interpretation. It basically counts the number of triangles. It's a chemical potential for the triangles in this dual lattice interpretation. So when you do, when you think of this as two-dimensional quantum gravity, it's nothing but the cosmological constant. So. So what you're doing, there is this uh, quantum Liouville theory. 
I mean, this is beautiful stuff. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it was done already quite a while ago. But I think it's very helpful, like since probably many of the younger people here were not exposed to this stuff, I highly recommend uh, looking it up. Because it's hard to appreciate this tensor model limit without knowing this. <laughs> this. And uh, so in these uh, review notes, I have there is some discussion of it. But there is much, much more you can look up. There are like, for example, uh, Greg Moore and Ginsberg wrote almost like a whole book about these matrix models. And, and I wrote a review about matrix quantum mechanics, uh, which works slightly differently, but similar idea. But essentially, uh, when you, so what is going on here? So suppose you are entrusted with some problem of like, uh, summing over, uh, over all two-dimensional matrix, right? Then you could say, okay, in two dimensions, the gravity is just not dynamical, it's topological. But po uh, Polyakov discovered this uh, term, which is, it's a kind of induced term, R1 over box R, D2x root G. And this term gives dynamics to the gravitational field. And when you go to the so-called conformal gauge, now I've dropped back from melons to non-melons. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so when you uh, take the conformal gauge, g mu nu is equal to e to the 2 phi, uh, or just e to the phi delta mu nu. This you can always pick, and everything boils down to integrating over these, these functions. This is called the Liouville field, or the conformal factor of 2D gravity. And then you find that the effective action from this R1 over box R just becomes something rather simple. It just becomes like 1 half d phi squared. And then if you add the cosmological constant, it just looks like e to the alpha phi like delta times e to the alpha phi. Uh, and then you just have d2x. So you have to solve this, this uh, theory with an exponential potential. And people have uh, developed techniques for solving it. In fact, Sasha wrote down uh, by an educated guess, three-point functions, four-point functions. So a lot is known about this theory. And this allows... Uh, allows uh, yeah, Sasha and, uh, and his brother wrote down uh, these, uh, basically this uh, exact correlators, which allow you to compare in very great detail with this matrix model calculations. Right, so this delta, so the reason you, this delta is like, it measures the number of, tri it's conjugate to the number of triangles, which is, when you think about it, because lambda, every time you put in a triangle, you put in a factor of, of g or lambda. So it's very natural that, that this delta is, is just a cosmological constant. Hmm. OK. OK, so, so this, is, uh, this is a very interesting story, which you can learn, a, you know, if it could itself be worth like a whole course because by now people have like a lot of control over very subtle analytic calculations and things like that. But then I just wanted to partly answer Zor's question about this d equals zero theory because that connects to uh, also what Subir showed, showed today. The, because of this, there is a very simple integral equation in d equals zero. Uh, which is uh, because of this Mellon dominance. And the equation is basically, so what you compute the sigma, sigma which is the self-energy, and sigma is just given by just uh, a triple of fully dressed propagators. So these are the full uh, the full propagators. 
with all melonic dressings. That's exactly the equation that Subir already wrote down in, in his model. Uh, you see that the leading, uh, yeah, this is just sigma in, the, there, is n there are no momenta, right? So sigma is just a number which is a function of, of this coupling G, right? Uh, so you get the equation like this, or let's call it lambda. So you get the equation that G inverse, the inverse propagator is just the bare propagator, which is 1 plus sigma. And sigma, if you're careful about factors, there are some factors here. Uh, sigma is uh, equal to minus lambda squared over... 36 times g, g of lambda cube, right? Because th this is a consequence of this melonic dominance, which I didn't prove yet, but I may like give more arguments for it next time. But then you basically can just solve this d equals zero model because then you convert these two equations to the following equation, which is g is equal to 1 plus lambda squared over 36 times g, g to the 4. Just uh, an equation which, uh, just uh, an algebraic equation. And, and the solution is, uh, is indeed, it just has branch cuts. I won't write down the full formula, but it's in my notes. It's like fourth roots and square roots of square roots, things like that. Uh, so it's, uh, but you, you can just develop this, using this you can iterate and develop to any order the sum over melonic graphs. Uh, but but here, is, uh, here is a crucial difference from this uh, matrix model, which is if you look at uh, what is the leading non-analytic term, so you can determine from here there is one additional small step that uh, that this G is related. So again, when you look at this tensor model, you can write like log Z divided by M cube is equal to F0, F0 of lambda plus some order one over N correction. And the question is, and this allows you to solve for F0 actually, because there is a relation that G is equal to 1 pr plus 4 lambda d by d lambda times F0. And you can from here deduce this F0 from the non-analytic behavior of G. And just to contrast it with a matrix model, so, so F0 matrix has this 5 halves power, but this is F0 matrix. But F0 tensor of lambda had like lambda squared, lambda C squared minus lambda squared to the 3 halves power. And this, so you see again, like for when lambda is not too big, even though the, mod the potential is not positive definite, you can still formally sum up the graphs. And there is no, but it again acquires some kind of branch cut. Uh, but this exponent here, three halves, is telling us something about very different structure of the sum over graphs. Like this is actually the most generic behavior called random polymer behavior. Uh, think uh, branch polymer, branch polymer. So there was something, actually the scaling exponent this is always called, in the old days, we called this like delta to the 2 minus gamma. And this was called the gravitational susceptibility. So this is the, the thing that you can compute uh, from Liouville theory. And here for the matrix, gamma matrix uh, is equal to minus 1 half. And negative susceptibility was a good thing. That sort of gives you nice smooth surfaces. But this one gives you gamma equal to one half. 
and all the people who worked on this dreaded one half because it's actually the most generic behavior and it gives a basically not surprisingly it gives you only graphs that develop these very long fingers kind of that go off to infinity so this is characteristic of this branched polymer phase uh, polymer and I think so this actually was essentially solved for a somewhat different model already several years ago by Bonzom et al. But then with Grisha Tarnapolsky, we revised solution for this ON cube model. It's rather generally applicable. And the disappointing thing is this branch polymer phase. And I think this kind of dashes hopes of application to, of an easy application to 3D quantum gravity. Because while well here you had these triangles glued together to form like an uh, interesting fluctuating surface which uh, didn't have this fingered phase. This one very generically gives a fingered phase, which is not surprising because these melon graphs are ladder-like, right? They, they basically look like these melonic uh, graphs are like ladders. They're essentially like uh, here is a generic melon graph. It's a long, long ladder with many such insertions. This is like a melon inside melon inside melon. So you have this ladder structure. And these are exactly the same ladders that you see in the SYK model. Uh, so, so the real, I think, uh, new life that was obtained for these uh, tensor models was... So for years, people are trying to apply to 3D quantum gravity, for example, by saying that, oh, we're just gluing these tetrahedra together in a similar way how people were gluing triangles for the matrix model. They were successful there. Why can't we be successful here? And I think the answer is this, uh, this basically. The so, but the similarity with SYK model basically came along only a couple years ago, and uh, Witten noted in his, uh, his very interesting paper where he also promoted the d equals zero bosonic model to d equal one fermionic model. And then uh, with Tarnapolsky, we wrote down a somewhat simpler uh, fermionic model, which uh, actually is more or less the closest thing you can get to the minimal Majorana SYK model. So in the remainder of lectures, I'll talk well, first I want to do a bit better job showing you what miracle occurs that you only get melon graphs without the, the disorder. And that just has to do with just pretty brute force counting of the index loops. And actually proof is, for this model, is very, very simple. It can be essentially presented uh, in a very limited time just to convince you that it's not just for this graph that the melon dominates, but well, you can, I, I, as a homework exercise, you can, for example, compute in this model, like, some simple melonic vacuum graphs, like, this is the basic melon, and then you can look at, for example, this, uh, this g to the 4 correction, and convince yourself that they all scale the right way uh, to, to give you some n cube scaling by counting up index loops and things like that. I think that that would be very useful. This is essentially, anyone can do this. Just draw these stranded graphs connected the right way and try to count the maximal number of index loops. And this maybe will be a good warm up to me trying to pr show how you cannot beat the sand cube scaling. Because the nightmare scenario would be that some subleading graph would suddenly give you n to the 4, and that the next one gives n to the 5th, and, and so on. But the claim is that as, as long as you scale this g as lambda over n to the 3 halves, then you always get n cubed times some power of lambda, and nothing bigger. And this n cube is exactly right, because it's the number of degrees of freedom in this tensor. So I think I'll stop here for now. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Uh, there, there is techniques in uh, matrix models.
models by which you can extract uh, energy density uh, functions at large end. Mm -hmm. So can these techniques be applied to tensor models also? Yes, so far actually the technique is quite different. Like the technique used for tensor models is like used by using Schwinger Dyson approach to some diagrams because there is uh, the matrix you can diagonalize. That's the crucial thing. Or even the non symmetric matrix, you can have the singular value decomposition. But that has not been used so far, at least for tensors. You, it's a more like, in some sense, less of a trick. You're just summing diagrams by the Schwinger Dyson. Okay, if there are no questions, let us thank Igor again.